All right, everyone. Welcome once again to the Faces of Business. I am your host, Damon Pistolka, and I am excited for our guest today because we have none other than Rich Hall from the Rich Hall Group. We're going to be talking about keys to preparing for a successful business exit. Rich, thanks for being here today, man. Man, we are thrilled. Let's get on it. Let's have a good time. Yes, yes. Well, Rich, I'm just I'm excited as heck because we we're talking a little bit more about this. And I want to, first of all, bring up what you do. It, it we may not quite say this in your headline on LinkedIn, but you are a business value advisor. And, yeah. and I think that's that's an interesting title. I, I know what it is and appreciate it. But uh, we'll get into that a little bit more. I just wanted to bring it up. But we always like to start out with your background, because I think that really kind of helps us understand the person behind Rich Hall. Yeah. Hey, I love it. It's um, so my career and I went back and looked at it probably, you know, six months ago and said, you know, how did I learn this stuff? And the reality is all of my career has been some either as an employee or an executive with companies has been some form of turnarounds whether it was a turnaround because it was they were really struggling or it yep. was, listen, we got massive growth and we got to get on it. And each one also had increased responsibility. So after I went through the gamut and I finally uh, was brought in as president of a multinational, uh, multi-generational family-owned business, mm -hmm. I took a step back and said, what I really enjoy doing, and it is, I love the challenge of helping businesses right side and get where they need to go extremely fast. So I went on the business advisor route and had clients and then actually got pulled into being more of an exit planning advisor by wealth advisors. Yeah. They were saying we got clients that are business owners and they're looking to do something in two to three years. And Rich, we need somebody that we trust and know and your name keeps coming up. So I went down that path and have absolutely enjoyed it. Yeah. So you, you mentioned exit planning and I, I, I want to ask you this question because I think what you're doing is a bit different than exit planning. Mm -hmm. And, and, but yet that's kind of the universal term. So if you could kind of give us the flavor of exit planning that you do, because uh, a lot of people look at exit planning. They think of somebody working in a magic calculator and, and coming up with numbers. Man, I'm glad you brought that up. Number one, I hate the word exit, right? Because everybody hates it. Business owners hate it. I hate it. You know, because it, number one, it infers binary, buy or sell, right? Yeah. And that's not, you know, what we do. Um, I actually go in. And I work with a business owner two to three years in advance of some kind of transition. It yep. could be a money raise. It could be sale to management. It could be a buyout. It could be strategic buyer, all kind of things. But here's the key. The business is not what I talk about first. I actually sit down with the owner and or owners and their spouses. And we talk about number one. What's your personal goals? What's important to you? What does life after the transition look like? And we get crisp on it because that's the number one priority. You follow all the way through the rest of the selling a business and transition, and you get down to the, the time to sign on the dotted line. More businesses fail because the owner starts reflecting and saying, maybe this is not what I want after all. So we cover the personal. Then cover, all right, how does that translate into financial goals? Because 80% of a business owner's wealth is tied up in the business. So their expectation is they're going to sell the business and it's going to end up fulfilling their financial goals. What if it doesn't? So we get crisp on that, right? The other part is the uh, their business goals. Is legacy important? Are, are what happened to the employees important? You know, I got one client that's like, yeah, man, these people have worked 20 years for me. I want to make sure they're taken care of. Mm -hmm. Okay, that can dictate the type of buyer, right? 
But on the flip side, I got another one that said, hey, Rich, I've given people great jobs for 15 years. Now it's my time. I want max value. Okay, now we know because that can dictate the different kind of value. So we cover that first. Then we go in full-blown 360 comprehensive assessment of the company. And it is very detailed. And uh, in essence, think of due diligence on steroids before the sale. Mm -hmm. And then we actually, the, the other piece is we actually do a uh, evaluation of the company. Mm -hmm. I personally bring an outside firm in. They do at least five different methods of valuation. Mm -hmm. And I use different firms depending on the size of the company. And then we layer on top of the valuation, the assessment, and it gives us a very good idea if it'll sell and if so, where it'll fall in the dollar amount. And if that amount matches what the owner's financial goals are, minus fees and taxes, of course, then we're good to go. Let's go ahead and get this thing going. If not, then we roll up our sleeves and we start working with the business and the owner over how to get that business from where it is today to where it needs to be to meet those goals. Hopefully that helps. That was a long answer, but no, no, that's, I'm glad you went through the process because, you know, a lot of people, a lot of business owners are sitting there today. As you said, they've got 80% or more of their wealth is tied up in that business and it can be significant amount, significant amounts of money. I mean, there's a lot, of, a lot of legacy businesses out here with tens of millions and sometimes hundreds of millions or more that's sitting in those businesses and they don't have a good idea of the valuation. And, and that's, that's a, that's a mistake that can surely bite you in the end. That's yes. What, um, yes, absolutely. And I also like I, covering the personal goals. I've, I've seen that happen even when you think you've covered the personal goals, even when you've done those things up to the end, they still, an owner still looks at it as, I don't know that this is the right thing or not. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it can come down to their identity. Yeah. You know, when most people think of moving on because they're either tired or, you know, hey, it's time to retire or I want to sell and do something different or whatever that looks like. But once they realize that, hey, even with negotiations and everything else taking place, money issue is off the table. That's no longer an issue. Now it gets real. Is it, I really enjoyed being the boss and now I'm no longer going to be the boss. Or I enjoyed going to work every day and seeing everybody, friends that I've had for years and years. Is this really what I want to do? I hit them up that very first thing. Because if we don't, you're right. They spend a ton of money all the way to get to the end and they're not happy with what they designed it or move. Yeah. With. Yep. And I, I love how you talk to that personal because it's not just financial. It's what's going to, going to happen after that. What are the, you know, what's their life going to be like? There are so many other things. And then as you, as you go into the, the financial goals and the personal about what I'm going to do. So they, even if they're fulfilled, then you have to walk through the legacy piece because there are a lot of people that, that, care or don't care about what happens to that business after. But that can, as you said, I think is really critical. Decide where you really want to try to transition out of or who a great buyer or a great next owner is going to be for you. Yeah, they, they most business owners have no idea how this whole process works. Uh, yeah. Even, you know, they don't know what the value of their company is. Uh, and I mean, if you think, if the company needs blood, then guess who the blood's going to come from? Yeah. The yeah. owner. You know, if it needs money, guess what? They're going to try to find a way of the money. So owners don't typically take care of themselves throughout the process. When, it, when we do the financial goals, for example, um, I have their financial advisor sitting down with us. So they hear the conversation. And if they don't have one, I refer them in. Mm -hmm. I, it, it's amazing the number of highly successful business owners that do not have an advisory team around them and they don't understand things like how much do I need? What about taxes? And all of this stuff needs to be planned out before the sale or what happens? If that check's written in your name, Uncle Sam's going to get 40%. Yeah. 
Yes. So we talk about all of this stuff well in advance. So when it comes time for the transaction, no surprises. Yeah, they that that is that's key. I mean, and you hit a hit on one that I think a lot of people don't realize is that if you do tax planning, especially if you're going to sell your business for tens of millions of dollars, it will save you probably a million or more dollars if you start your tax planning five, six, seven years early because of some of the waiting periods, some of the other things you can do. And, and you just get, you know, those those smart people at that point are worth their weight in gold almost. Yes, I I, uh, I do a lot of networking like you do, but a lot of my networking is with those type professionals, uh, wealth advisors, estate planning attorneys, uh, transactional attorneys, CPAs, you know, on and on, because as we go through this journey, the owner is looking at us as the person to guide them. Mm -hmm. And we need to make sure that it's not solely about the business, that we're also focused on getting them in front of the right people to take care of themselves uh, financially in the best way possible. And mm -hmm. most just have never navigated this. They don't know what it means. Mm -hmm. How many people do you work with have had the same CPAs, you know, from many, many, many years and have outgrown them and not realized it? Man, you've been around, haven't you? Um, I have conversations with clients because most of them, those people that started off, great, great, great example. Um, somebody may have been a bookkeeper with the company. Company's grown. Then all of a sudden, they're like, hey, I want a title. I want a controller. Okay, great. Now they're a controller. Then they keep growing as a company. And next thing you know, they're like, hey, I want to be the finance director or I want to be a CFO. And a lot of business owners, again, they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. So there's so many things that as a company grows and its size and responsibilities and the complexities occur that that person that helped them start out may not be the right resource at the next level. Yeah. And I see yeah. that constantly. Uh, and I do my best to help them, to train yeah. them, to give them insight and et cetera. But sometimes it's also a hard conversation to say, maybe you ought to consider outsourcing or, or bringing somebody else in yeah. just for the reason you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Cause uh, the, the, the one thing that, most business owners don't realize, I, I believe, even in a larger business, is the the financial, I should say, the financial resources that a business transaction will take to actually get it done, especially when you get bigger. It, it is, it, if you're not ready to go, if you don't, in the amount of prep work and the tens of thousands of dollars you'll spend on experts to get ready um, for your financial stuff, is is a shock to most business owners yeah you know when <laughs> and it's also one of the biggest delays that i have yeah as far as getting these valuations done because i walk them through and i say listen number one we got to have about four years of prior plus we need the rolling 12 months of the current year they want to see trends and the different valuation methods require that and and it's amazing the amount of businesses out there that either don't close their books on a timely basis. They've got their account, either their accounting team or they may use an outside that hadn't filed their taxes and keep doing, you know, uh, uh, you know, postpone and et cetera. And during those circumstances, I'll look at them and say, you know, how confident are you in these numbers? Because I can say, let me tell you, once you get a buyer involved, they're going to look at, they'll walk through this concept called quality of earnings. They may do a QOE on it. I can guarantee you if there's any problems, they're going to find it. And if they find it, they're immediately skeptical and going to say, well, what else may you either be hiding mm -hmm. or not aware of? And it can kill the deal. So there's a lot of times I'll bring in my own firm and say, all right, we need to go through and just take a look and validate these these numbers 
and it takes time and it takes a lot of resources, but it's yeah. better to do it up front than spend yeah. all of that money. And you're right, get killed on the back end. It will. And it, and you know, at the least, I think you're going to lose millions of dollars out the backside because of it. Like you said, that the lack of trust in the numbers. So they're going to figure that as more risk and reduce the, reduce the pen, potential price. And, and when you look at it, if I got to spend 50 or a hundred thousand dollars on a, on, on a, finding the problem and fixing the problems, uh, it's, it's well worth it when you consider the millions it costs on the back end. Yes. And, yeah. hundred percent. I, I actually, when I do my initial assessment, the valuation of the company, I actually give them a grading on the different areas like nice. finance that's dragging down the value. And I can show them that, listen, this drag down is going to impact you by X amount of dollars. So when they have to turn around and spend money to fix it, we have the conversation that says, yeah, you may spend $50,000, but guess what? It's going to impact your valuation by, you know, $5 million or whatever yeah. the number is. Now they get business people can get it when it's put in terms of business. Mm -hmm. You know, if not, they're just like, wait a minute, people try to get me to spend money every day. Man. Why should I spend money on something when I got a perfectly good bookkeeper slash, you know, accountant. Um, and, but when you put it in terms, they understand, then they're like, all right, Rich, let's get on it. Yes. Well, and this, this is where, this is where I love it when I'm talking with a, with a business owner about their exit, if they're thinking about selling their business and, and I always <laughs> say it like this. I ask them what they think their multiple is on the sale of their business, whatever it is. Could be two, could be 200. Doesn't yeah, really matter. What do they tell you? Oh, it's way higher than it always is because they read a public company uh, statement and they they use that. A lot of people think that, that but there's no, no comparison. Uh, yeah. But that's what they always say. And it's always, it, and even if they're close, they're usually, you know, a few multiples higher. But this is really in the, in, in the exit era of your business it's really the only time where you can get multiples of your profitability the increase you make right so mm -hmm. if i can increase my profitability by a dollar i might get six eight ten whatever the multiple is four dollars in at the exit so yes. When we talk talk about that with somebody, you can see the really that this is a time when if it is a good investment at this time, there's really not other times in the business that you can get that kind of return that quickly. Multiples in a return yeah. of what you're doing. That that's and I explained to them when I speak, there's a difference between an income based business and a value based business. You know, yeah. value is determined by the buyer, right? Or whoever's willing to spend that kind of money. But I'll even explain this. Listen, you can have a really strong income profitable company and it still may not be sellable. Yep. And they're looking at you like you're out of your mind. I'm making a million dollars a month in my business. I'm like, yeah, but if you're the guy that's got all the relationship with the primary suppliers, you play golf every weekend with the, your top customers. 50% of your revenue is coming from three different customers. Guess what? Your business is not going to sell as is. Then they pull a step back and they're like, man, you're right. Okay. What do I do? All right. Now let's get to work. And it's exactly yeah. like you're talking about. Now you got their attention. You help them understand how this stuff works. Then they're willing to do what it takes until yeah. then. Hey, I'm pulling a million a month, man. Don't tell me yeah. my business is not worth something. Okay. Yes. Spend a few million, go to market and see what happens. Yes. Well, and it, you make a great point. And it happens every day, every day. Um, I don't know how many people. And and even if even if you say you won't sell, you won't be able to sell your business. It doesn't mean you won't get an offer. It means if, if right. you get an offer, it could be so ridiculously low that you will never take it in a million years because mm -hmm. it, they'll they'll discount it. So so poor or so much. And yes. It, it just really is an opportune time for people that want to listen and, and take the direction and make those changes. I mean, we've seen incredible swings in, in from, I went to, I got an investor that wanted to buy the company investment group and it was, 
you know, a third of what it was, should have been or half of what it should have been and to fixing it and going out and getting your market premiums. If mm -hmm. you, if you do what you're supposed to do. Um, but those things, like you said, owner dependence, dependence on the income, dependence on a customer, those are real big. And it's, it's easy to build up like in your area, right? There's, there's a few big companies in Houston and, uh, and, yeah. uh, it would be very easy to build a hundred over the years. If you were in Houston a long time ago, build a hundred million dollar company, let's say it does something with energy and mm -hmm. you could have two customers literally yep. and, or one. And it could be, like you said, it could be, I've known rich for 40 years. We do vacations together. We go golfing together. We hunt together. It's a, whatever we do. And that thing is not so. Yeah. And, and the thing is, you're exactly right. And the tough part is owners don't understand that because, hey, what they're doing today works. So why is there an issue? But when you use the exam, exact same example but then you tell them okay but if you go back and tell that guy you're playing golf with who's your number one client that you know hey i think i'm going to wrap this thing up unless you've got a long-term contract that's rock solid and locked in and that's part of what we talk with him about then he's going to go back and say hey the relationship is no longer there let's open it up for bid and guess what? A buyer, one of the things I, you know, we look at is we talk about what do the contracts look like? Are they assignable? Because you, you can have a buyer come in, the contracts are not assignable, then guess what? All of them could go up to bid if need be. Mm -hmm. So depending on how the contract's done, how the sale is done, it can be pretty complicated. But the buyer's going to do that. He's going to have a legal team that's going to say, I want to go in due diligence and I want to start seeing the contracts at the top, you know, mm -hmm. uh, clients and vendors and suppliers. Yep. Same way. Yeah, it is. We actually ran into that a number of years ago now that uh, business that we had was, was getting an offer and we knew that the, the, the customer contracts had to be approved by the customer. Mm -hmm. And, just so happens that when we went to that customer to talk about getting it approved, they decided that they wanted to bring those contracts back in house. See, imagine if you just bought that company and then that happened to you. So it, that's why they don't. And it, you brought it up earlier. Very. I'm glad you did. Buyers look at the kind of risk associated with the company and they discount the price or factor in dependencies, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of different scenarios to minimize that risk as much as possible. And revenue risk is huge. Employee risk is another top employees, top sale. I've seen a company that, man, they went from like zero to evaluation, I didn't do it. I just, I know the, the owner, um, you know, $200 million in like three years. Mm -hmm. And the owner was like, man, I'm going to go buy an island somewhere. But they got through due diligence. And what they found out was the salespeople were 1099 contractors. Ooh. And the buyer's like, wait a minute, you don't have long-term contract. They're not employees. I can't pay you that kind of money. What happens if they leave? They're not a... I yeah. don't have an employment contract with a 1099 employee. The whole deal fell apart. Yeah. And I was like, man, if I had known that, I'd have told you. All you had to do is lock them down, put a good retention bonus in front of them. And then you would have been sitting on an island right now that had your name on it. Yeah. yeah. They just don't think it. they don't know about that kind of stuff in advance. Yeah, it's it, because it does not it does not affect the day-to-day -day operations of the business. It, your business can continue to run. As you said, you could be making a million dollars a month. It could be very successful in this industry. 
could be you could be smart, you could be, be running it wonderfully, but if the the team is not there, if that those relationships aren't going to be retained just as strong the day before the transition as they are the day after, all that is figured into what a buyer is going to consider. Yes, yeah. and see that's there's the concept as we know of how important the financials are. And when a valuation comes in, a market approach, as they call it for the valuation, yeah. so it's a multiple of EBITDA. Well, number one, they don't all understand that it's an adjusted version of your financials, right? Yeah. So you have to go through that. But the other part, the biggest driver of higher multiples is not your financials. It's your intangibles, like your leadership team, the capacity of your company, the upside of the market you're in, mm -hmm. what kind of customers do you have today? Uh, systems, processes, are they scalable so they can grow such that the buyer has a very large and nice upside? That's what gets a higher multiples. And that's where guys like you and I go in and help them understand, evaluate it, and then let's help them get to where they need to be. So they do get the higher multiples. Yeah. So as you're working with companies and you're you're seeing them transition out and they do the work, they put mm -hmm. the work in. Mm -hmm. um, what kind what kind of are you seeing that these people can get premiums when they sell? Or or do you do you think that this is just more making it so they can get sold? Um depends on what we're we're working on, right? Or fixing. yeah. Oh, if they got a good product, good service, good market, then doing the things that we talk about are very attractive to buyers because buyers are much more sophisticated than sellers. Buyers are already get the teams to do people. You know, you may have worked on the buyer side some and as, as an advisor and helping, but they go through a number of businesses before they may find the right one to buy. So when you go into a, you know, a, you know, a dance where there's discussions to see whether or not you want to move forward with a, a, a deal before you go under, you know, LOI, and et cetera, then you talk with a buyer and you say, listen, yes, we have our top employees. We've got a retention program already ready to go. We've communicated to them. Our owner takes off Monday and Fridays and works half mm -hmm. days during the week. Okay. Our systems are documented. Our processes are, we've got great leadership. And I mean, you start laying all that out in front of them, their eyes get massive because they're like, wait a minute. That means my risk is low and I can hit the ground running with this company. And then when I tell them, listen, you don't even have to negotiate. The owner has already agreed to a six month you know, earn out period and do a owner finance as part of the deal. That's not a negotiation that falls apart. We've already set that owner up what to yes. expect far in advance. Buyers will, they go nuts over a company that's laid out like that for them. Yeah, you are, that you said a couple of things in there that I really think that if, if someone's listening today, uh, that that is considering and transitioning out of their business really needs to understand because um, you said you talked about working with the the seller to get a number in mind, get terms in mind for the sale of that business so that the transition can be pretty smooth rather than tons of negotiation where you're starting too high or too low or wherever you're at and and all the the angst that that caused, and I'm, I'm probably not using the right word, but because if you get that done ahead of time, like you're saying, you, you don't get that deal fatigue like you do if you're back and forth and back and forth and back and forth with that deal, because you you can make it easier for the buyer. You, you've satisfied a lot of their risk, risk challenges. And as a seller, you're really comfortable with the number you've talked about then because you've had time to think about it. It's not yeah. like we're we're sitting here today and oh we got a counter offer today and we got another offer back we got counter again. The owner doesn't the seller doesn't have time to really think about it. If you talk about this three months before you you go to market or whatever you're going to do with this, 
I have a lot of time to think about it. It's like you yeah. can think about it and get comfortable with it and go, I'm good. And, and I, then I actually, you, you nailed it. I, I, I run a CEO round table as well to uh, some other things. And one of the owners in my round table uh, had a family office dive in and they're like, Hey, we want to buy your company. If you don't sell it to us, we're going to buy your competition and put you out of business. So, you know, they were, they were in a, a spot. Yeah. Um, and got a great deal, but there was also some things and he had a long earnout period. There's some other things that popped up and I asked him, I said, Hey man, why don't you put together sort of the lessons learned? Cause you just went through it. And he did. And he sent it to me and every other word, was I wish I'd called or knew or worked with an, you know, an exit advisor like you and me or somebody like, and I said, listen, man, you can't put that out there. Not, you know, that, that looks like it's an advertisement for me. I said, what did you learn? And he came back and, and I, you know, I can send it out to people if they want it because it's cleaned up, but it, it's in detail. It's like, I wish I'd known more about the process. I wish I'd had the right team around me. I leveraged some of the buyer's resources because, you know, everybody shook hands and sang kumbaya. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I found out things afterwards that I would have done different. And it's it's real life. But not being prepared and not understanding how it works is tremendous, both personal and financial risk for a seller. Yeah. You know, as you said, the title says, you know, preparing for a successful business exit is, is something that, um, while well, worth the effort, almost all the time. I don't think you'd run in a time when you're not going to benefit from it. And like you said, you you you're not stuck with trying to use whatever resources you have available. You can have the time to get the right resources and get the right advice and do the right work ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So as you're looking at this, what is talking to the business owners across the across across them all? If you had to name the top two things that you see consistently in businesses that you're going to have to do some work to, what would they be? Um, well, number one is uh, they don't know how the process works. That's probably the bigger thing. Process so it's educating the, the, the business owner, what to expect and all the stuff that we need to get done and to work on. Um, I think then after that is um, you got to get the financials squared away and cleaned up because, I mean, hey, here's the thing. We all know. Run everything you can through the business legally to minimize your profits. Therefore, you pay less taxes. Mm -hmm. But when you go through a transaction, you know, the buyer wants to see the true picture. So now you got to go back and do an adjusted version. It says, hey, you know, the boat and the house that you run in and, you know, maybe those weekends and et cetera, we need to scrape those back out. So now it gives a true picture. So that's one of the biggest things of the cleanup that needs to be done. And that education of the difference between income versus, you know, value. After they get it and it clicks, these other things just make sense to them because then they understand. Mm hmm. That's a good point. That's a good point. So what do you like the most about helping people do this? Um, man, we change lives, right? I mean, that to me is uh, probably the biggest thing yeah. is that uh, they've got some kind of goal, some kind of dream, some kind of plans. And being able to affect that and them seeing the results, um, man, it's why I do what I do. Yeah. It's because I know I'm, too, and it's not just a lie for the business owner. It may be their couple, the owner and the spouse. It could be the entire kids. It could be the generations. It can be the other employees. Mm -hmm. And man, remember we said earlier, 70% of the businesses that go to market don't end up selling. Yep. Imagine those families, the baby boomers that are, you know, they work their whole lives with the expectation, hey, I'm going to sell my business. That's my retirement. And it doesn't happen. 
So getting in front of that and helping make sure it does happen, that's what gets me up, man. I love it. That's awesome. And I, I agree too. It's it's just such a it's such a great thing to be able to help people realize uh, a result from their hard work. Yes. Because it's it is and it and it's it's understandable when you when you're running a business that you may not know about what the end looks like and what an exit is or a sale looks like or even a, a transition to a succession with a family member uh, to do what you need to do. But it really is in, in in the middle of your career, I think if you spent time figuring that out a little bit, you can you can come out the other end a lot better. Yeah, people don't know a lot of owners and a lot of people in the market are in this sort of business, whether it's buying and selling and advisory service and all that. They don't know that people like you and I exist. Mm -hmm. Because today what happens, you know, if an owner wakes up one day and says, you know what, I, you know, I'm thinking about doing something with my business. All right. Well, here's the two scenarios that play out. Um, oh, Mr. Hall, I heard you may be interested in selling your business. Man, I know this great, whether it's broker, M&A, investment banker, you know, my neighbor yep. got 10 times X. Okay. And it's a very attractive story. And I'm not saying that these, these people do a great job at what they do, but their job is to sell the business. And that's how yes. they're compensated on it. Versus somebody like you and I and says, well, Mr. Business Owner, we really need to talk because we need to understand a little bit more about what your goals are, how the business is performing and to see whether it'll sell at all. And if so, give you a pretty good idea of where it would sell at. And if it works, fantastic. Let's go. If it doesn't, we got work to do. Which one of those sounds the best? The first yeah. one, right? What's best for the business owner and their families? The second, in most cases. Mm -hmm. So the delta between the two is don't wait to the last minute when you may have to sell your business because you're exhausted and worn out. Plan far enough in the head. Educate yourself. Have a conversation with people like you and I and learn how all of this works, then you can take time and prepare, right? What's the other thing that happens? 50% of businesses close involuntarily, right? You remember, what are they? Divorce? Yeah, death. Distress, death, you know, disagreement, yeah. disease, whatever. Those things happen, you know, all right, somebody's, yes, business owner died, guess what happens to the business? You know, odds are pretty good. It goes to whoever is the uh, the spouse or is in the will of the business owner. Do yes. they know how to run a business? Boom, goes under. Versus doing things like we're talking about. So the business is not so dependent on the owner and it could run effectively. A lot of things mm -hmm. you can do in advance, but if they don't yeah. know, they don't know any better. Yep. And that's where you said getting educated about the process early of how to build that business that is going to be a valuable business at the end, rather than just an income generator for you. Um, yes. So that you can then they, then they have choices in the way they exit. That's exactly right. It's their it's their path forward and they can make choices with educated, you know, uh, information around them. So by, by far the best way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good how you put that together because it it's not at, at the, the first look of the two options. It, you may, you may think that at the, that there is an easy path, but there's very rarely an easy path to get in a business, get exited a business. Yeah. It, it's it, people don't, you know, it, it's, um, as you said earlier, when the process starts, you may think it's taking forever, but when that final negotiation hits, very stressful, people just want it to be over with. But when it is, it's amazing how the deal can change. And it may not be in the, the seller's best interest. Yeah. Just because all the thing, risk aversion, things we talked about, but knowing it up front, being prepared, knowing what the value of the business is in a very close range. I know what I've got. 
So I'm willing to stand firm and work with the buyer, but you're not going to come in here and tell me all the things that are wrong with it. I already know where we're at. So yes, let's do this deal. Huge, huge. You said it, 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 we're getting close to time, but I do have to bring that up because yep. when a buyer is armed with knowledge or a seller is armed with knowledge, they know where the warts are at and they've worked on them and they know where they're still at and they know and they're comfortable with that and their business is moving in the right direction and they know that the, the difference in the whole process is remarkable because as you said, I can sell it to you today at the price we think is fair Mm-hmm. Or we can wait and I can sell it to somebody else because I know what I'm doing. I'm only getting better. Amen, brother. Doesn't that provide tremendous negotiating ability? Yes, it does. And it'd be great for the business owner to be in that chair when it happens. So yep. you nailed it, man. I'm glad you said that. Well, Rich, it has been incredible talking to you. Again, we're talking with Rich Hall here from the Rich Hall Group. And if someone wants to get a hold of you, Rich, what is the best way to do that? Hey, I tell you, hit my website, uh, richhallgroup.com. There we go. I've got emails, got ways to collect on LinkedIn. Uh, and I've also got documents out there on the process that we're talking about. Yep. You uh, do. And that's not only for business owners, but also for advisors that may work in the exit. You know, yeah, well. I've downloaded, looked at them. You've got some good quality downloads there for people, my friend. And I and I do it, uh, advise people to take a look at the richhallgroup.com website. Reach out to Rich Hall if you want to talk with him yourself and get yourself, as Rich said, and I agree with 100 percent. Get that education early. Know what you need to do to build a business that's going to be valuable and provide you the income you want while you're doing it so that you can choose to exit the way you want. You're the man. Thank you. Thanks for being here today, Rich. Thank you for listening today. We got someone that commented today. He said, awesome insight. Thank you so much. Uh, we couldn't see your name, but i tell you what, we appreciate you. If you came in late to the show, go back to the beginning. Listen to what Rich was talking about. He was talking about some of the things that make deals go bad or not as good as they could. He talked about the importance of education and getting yourself ready and finding that team that's going to help you get out the right way ahead of time. We will be back again next week. Rich, hang out, and we'll finish up offline. You got it. Thank you.